Hey, welcome back. I'm uh, happy to be joined here by Jay again. And in today's conversation, we kind of want to talk about the helicopter pilot pipeline, um, the journey it takes to go from nothing to being in the industry. You know, we're all inspired by what we see these helicopters doing and we want to do it. So we just want to shed some light on how it's actually done, my journey and his journey. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and why don't you talk about your journey a little bit and then I'll talk about mine. Sounds good. Good morning, Devin. I'm Jay Lugo uh, from the channel Skybomb. I'm also a uh, commercial instrument uh, rated helicopter pilot. And uh, as far as the journey, I got to say mine's uh, been the most non-traditional journey as far as uh, from, you know, like you went to Mauna Loa. A lot of, I know a lot of people that went to SUU and different big um, part 141 schools. I actually did it a little bit different. Um, I started with a smaller flight school in Kissimmee, and I got to a point where I was about to do my uh, private, um, I was an add-on, I, I started fixed wing. So I got to the point where I was going to start uh, pretty much just getting that add-on, and I struck a lock. I met uh, an operator flight instructor, meaning that the gentleman actually owned his own R-22, and he instructed out of it. So very, very small, um, tiny operation, word of mouth type, type of deal. And uh, I've gotten um, most of my ratings, or actually all my ratings I got with this gentleman. I got my uh, private add-on. I was able to do my commercial. And then the last rating that we completed last year was the instrument helicopter. So I was able to complete those uh, like that, but also, uh, because he didn't operate all the time, I also went out to different parts of Florida and I complimented at different flight schools. So I've flown at uh, schools, uh, I don't know if you remember Bristow uh, yep. back in the day. I've flown at Bristow. I've I flown with the uh, uh, Tampa Bay Aviation folks uh, over in Clearwater. I've gone down to Pompano Beach and flown with Florida Coast to Coast. And then also I made friends and uh, those friends... Uh, they were leasing a helicopter. So we, we flew down uh, North Perry. I'm not sure if you're familiar yep. with that field in South Florida. We flew a little bit out of there. Then those friends actually bought their own ship and I did a little time building with them. So it's it's been a, a, a variety of, um, of different experiences along the way um, that, you know, from going to a 141 course and you're flying to different islands like you know you were in hawaii uh the guys in uh like seu there in utah up in the mountains and they really only know that area mine was a little bit diverse in the sense that you know as pilots we're going to be flying in different environments so it's very important for us to get comfortable with flying in different uh places so you know that's that's actually really interesting um as you were speaking i just uh, a couple of things that you mentioned that, and you know, I see really three ways um, of the pilot pipeline, three ways that people can go through their flight training. So how you did it was kind of the independent side. You reached out to someone, a small operator, uh, just a CFI with a helicopter. Um, and that's, that's a great way to do it. Just reaching out to someone that can do all your ratings. Another way to do it is just go to uh, an established flight school. Like the company I work for is called Independent Helicopters. We are a flight school um, and we just do training. And how our training works is people come to us, we've got a facility uh, and we do all of our training out of there. And it's primarily at the student's discre discretion. So we, we work with people that have, have other jobs, have their lives and they come in when they can, which is a fine way to do it. There's two other ways to do it. There's the college route um, and college program. So a bunch of colleges have either a flight school at the school or they contract out all of their flight training to another flight school um, through a college program. So you can go and get maybe your associates or your bachelor's degree, as well as getting your uh, flight ratings. Um, and then the final way that the most common way is uh, it's kind of like a mesh between the college program and just the generic flight school program, which is uh, what I went to. So SUU, uh, Southern Utah um, University, they've got uh, a college program, but they also do all of their flight ratings. And then where I went to called Mauna Loa Helicopters is a big organization out in Hawaii. And it's not college. So I wasn't getting any college degrees, but I was getting all of my flight school ratings. And it was a full time job. It was it worked like college um, all day, every day, taking classes, grounds, flight school. Um, 
gone up for flight. So there's about four different ways to do it. And as you alluded to, there's pros to every single one. So like you did it, you got to fly with multiple different operators in diverse environments, um, got to work at different airports. Where I went, um, we were pretty much in the same environment every day. So my weather didn't change, which is um, all right. And th that's one thing. But the benefit of where I went is your training is extremely, um, it, it's just combined very tightly. Um, and it's a super short condensed program. But like the college program, you get a rate or you get a degree at the end of it. So there's pros and cons. When Before you got into flight school um, and while you were there, what was one of the biggest things you wish you had known prior and what you would tell yourself before going on this journey? Devin, actually, uh, one thing that I wish I would have known uh, was something that a channel called Cape Copters by Paul Salmon put out. Uh, it's actually a video, video series. It says how to save forty to fifty thousand dollars on your ratings, and the way that he explains this is if you actually go for your gyroplane ratings first and go through those, then there's no minimum time with your helicopter, your rotorcraft ratings. Now, of course, you know you got to take into account that Robinsons have their own time built into it, but you could potentially go through your ratings at minimal hours, and then afterwards you can actually take that money and go time bill anywhere you want in the nation and you know save yourself a heap of money and also experience different things that you know um you know from flying in new york flying in, in the mountains in utah flying down in florida different things you can kind of spice it up however you want to and so that's one thing that i wish i would have known because i, I certainly would have taken advantage of that if uh if that would have been uh, knowledge that was privy to me. I actually found this out when I was uh, going for my CFI. It's part of the knowledge test where it actually does bring up the fact that, you know, for gyroplanes, you, it requires no hour uh, limits. Plus, you know, when you think about it in the aerodynamic side, every landing that these guys are making in this, this gyroplane, it's an auto rotation. Yeah. So, so technically, you are going to get so good at autos that it's not even going to be funny, you know, compared to, uh, you know, just people that just started in helicopters, autos are going to be a breeze. So that's another upside of uh, doing it that way. So that's definitely, certainly for me, one thing that I wish I would have known. You know, that, and actually throughout my entire CFI training and actually being a CFI, this concept hasn't come to, I just haven't been aware of it. And that's really interesting that you can do that. And actually, Jay just got a call from Chris Case. He is uh, from the YouTube channel called um, Heli of a Ride. You can go check out his channel. The link will be in the description below. He's actually working uh, down in the Gulf right now, and he called in. So we've got a little clip from that, but then we'll get back to the interview afterwards. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, thanks for letting me come in. I'm currently in the Gulf of Mexico. My name is uh, Christopher Case. I work for uh, PHI, a uh, great company. Currently, like I said, I'm in the Gulf of Mexico on the platform, working a two week hitch, 14 on, 14 off. Uh, I just started with them in September, so this is about my fourth hitch on. It's going great. Uh, you, get to, you get you catch on real quick, especially with the weather. Weather changes uh, increasingly out here. Uh, it was storming a minute ago, and I was about to take off, but uh, I couldn't see the visibility of this one platform on 10 statue miles. But, um, so I had to shut down because it wasn't safe. Uh, so it's clearing up now, but it was canceled, so I'm not going to be flying. Basically, we have a lot of uh, high winds and dust going on today. I also have a channel. It's called uh, Heli of a Ride. Uh, check it out. Um, but what it's basically about is uh, helicopters, some contracting work I did in Afghanistan military. Um, I post when I can. I'm quite busy out here at times, but I do uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, shots out here. I just haven't been able to put on, but check it out. And... Uh, um, on a similar note, something that I hear super frequently um, amongst all of the different uh, pilots we talk to, um, where I go to school, just in online uh, community discussions is going for your fixed wing ratings prior. Now, the biggest argument for this is fixed wing, in, fixed wing is significantly cheaper. So if you take like a Cessna 172 or even a 152 versus a Robinson R22 or R44, it's typically 
uh, less than half the cost. So the rate, the the charges that my school puts out is about four hundred dollars per hour for the twenty two, about six hundred dollars per hour for the forty four. Now, in the Cessna one fifty two or one seventy two, it's typically going to be less than half of that. So the argument goes that you should go get your fixed wing rating prior. One because it's typically less complex and people can do it typically easier. I'm not saying it's easier, but typically can be done easier with fewer ratings. And then you can go get your add on helicopter and it's going to be less hours. You're going to have the aeronautical experience and the knowledge. And all you have to do is work on the helicopter flying skills. So this is something that as an instructor is, is kind of a difficult question for me to answer because financially it, it, it can make sense. However, there are like if you if you want to fly helicopters, I think you should commit to flying helicopters. If you want to fly both, then it's good. You should go get your fixed wing and then your helicopter. But if you're committed to helicopters, do it. And the final point with this is people that go from fixed wing first and then come over to helicopter, they can have this dangerous transfer of knowledge. So you can develop pretty dangerous habits in the heli or in the airplane that are fine for the airplane, but super dangerous for the helicopter. And that switch. Is, is is typically problematic so what do you think about that well i i actually love the that last part that you threw in there the those dangerous habits so in in my uh personal experience what i did was i started with my fixed wing i was able to finish my um my private certificate and as i was into my instrument training in airplanes is when i realize said i want to fly helicopters so i was a very um low hour uh fixed wing pilot when i actually transitioned to my private uh add-on so i say the lower time pilot you are and you begin the transition the better it will be because once you're a cfi in airplanes you have your multi you have all these things those bad habits are already ingrained. So the more time that you take in doing that transition, then the more you're, you might potentially struggle to uh, just basically get that concept. Uh, and it really, when it plays a big factor is when you're uh, dealing with uh, semi-rigid rotor systems, which are very typical on Robinsons. Now, if you're jumping into a, a three, a Schweitzer 300 or a Cabri, it might be a might it might be a more forgiving aircraft. But uh, most people they're gonna jump in a Robinson, uh, specifically an R22. And if you are uh, at any moment, if you pull, put that uh, cyclic down you know, abruptly, you're going to get you, yourself in a low G situation very quickly. And so that's, that's one of the things that I do recommend. Um, yeah, sure, go get your private um, uh, certificate in fixed wing, because it will, you know, your aerodynamics, the radios, you're going to be so far ahead. But don't spend too much time on, on the fixed wing ratings as, you know, as early as a private certificate go ahead and jump on the helicopter side because then you can solidify those good habits in the helicopter. And, and you know, most people that, that are after this, they want to be helicopter pilots. So, you know, stick with the helicopters if that's what you want. And then afterwards, you can always go back to airplanes. They're always going to be there. So that's and my advice. On that point, um, well, we're not here to bash airplanes. He's an airplane pilot. I've got nothing but admiration for airplanes. Uh, and I've actually got a couple of uh, videos on my channel about why airplanes are better than helicopters in some aspects. But, you know, one point I want to make is if you are a duly rated pilot, you have both your fixed wing, let's say commercial fixed wing and commercial helicopter, you are in a position to get a lot of jobs that is highly desirable in the marketplace if you are a duly rated pilot that puts you in a good position now where i want to pivot the conversation to is so after you get your ratings let's say you get your commercial once you get your commercial helicopter rating you are not necessarily capable and ready to fly commercial jobs 
once you go through flight school and you get your commercial rating, you cannot go fly EMS. You will not get hired to fly EMS. You will most likely not get hired to fly firefighting or police chases, all the real commercial jobs. What I want to talk about is the typical pipeline progression after you get your commercial rating and what it takes to actually get to those jobs. So I'll let you go ahead and lead this off and then I'll come on the backside. Yeah. So the common misconception, as you said, um, when you get that commercial or you tell somebody you're a commercial uh, pilot is, that, yeah, they, they're thinking you're flying EMS, you, you're flying for law enforcement, firefighting, all kinds of things go into um, your general public's mind. And really, it, all it is, is, uh, for example, um, let, let's kind of put it in terms that uh, people can relate. When you go and get your CDL, you know, for example, you might be able to drive a 18 um, wheeler or what have you, but you're a very new driver, you know, so would you want, you know, your, your guy that just got his license uh, to drive hazardous freight, to drive, you know, cross country, to drive these different, you know, routes that um, could be dangerous to the general public? Of course not, you know, and, and you know, a lot of things, a lot of, um, of our job is dictated by the insurance companies, uh, whether we like it or not. And every time that there is an incident or accident, the insurance companies, what do they do? They, they re-examine as they should, and you know, the, the rates do go up. So, um, so that's what another thing that, um, that a lot of people don't know, that our, our aviation is very insurance driven. So, uh, so when you go into your commercial jobs, like for example, I got my, my commercial rating at 109 uh, rotary hours you know, very, very low, uh, something that you can do because I had my, um, my private um, certificate in fixed wing. So I was able to forego the whole 150 hours. I um, mean, I did have the 150 hour total flight time. So, um, but at 109 hours, you know, no company is going to look at you, you know, that they're, they're going to be like, oh, that's great. Go build some hours and, uh, you know, come back when you have at least 300, uh, ideally 500 hours is what they're looking for. So um, that that's that's one of the caveats that a lot of pe people think, okay, I got my commercial, I got my instrument, now I can go and, and get go get myself a job. Possibly, if you have good connections, you can uh, definitely, you know, there, there's jobs out there that you can kind of uh, go into and, you you know, you better be ready to work some ground crew, you know, for sure, and, and prove your worth to that operator. You're not just going to jump in the helicopter first day, crank her up and go, you know, you, you're, you're there as a, as a low man on the totem pole, but it's like you, you know, it, you come on, you get your CFI, your double I, and then you can expect to, to train some students. That's, that's going to be your, usually your first job. Um, in my case, which we'll go into a little bit later on, it wasn't like that, but go ahead and take it away. Yeah. So one of the things that I, so I was actually considered going, considering going into the medical field. Um, I wanted to be a doctor, be a physician. Um, I, I always want to do something, you know, if you ask my mom, she'll tell you my mind changes every day what I want to do. So I was actually considering going into the medical field. So I, I know uh, a fair bit about it. And I actually think getting your commercial rating is kind of like getting um, your doctor certificate, like your, your MD, your medical certificate. So yes, you have gone through all the schooling, you have the knowledge, and you are technically a doctor, you are technically a commercial pilot, but you're not really qualified. You're not qualified until after you go through residency, and residency is where you really train, and maybe you take a fellowship where you really uh, do, like really focus in on what you're doing. And then eventually you'll become an, att an attending physician where you are the top dog. You really know what you're doing. You've spent years perfecting your craft. Same thing with aviation. Once you finish flight school with your commercial rating, maybe with your instrument too, which are like the minimums to be a commercially rated pilot, 
um wherever you get so maybe you get it at 100 200 hours these commercial jobs are not really going to pick you up until a thousand, fifteen hundred, and really two thousand. Those are the big numbers. So two thousand after two thousand, you're pretty much qualified for anything. So getting from your one hundred to two hundred to your two thousand, that's your your commercial is your license to learn. And those eighteen hundred hours is where you're really learning how to fly. When you finish flight school, you know the basics, um, but you. I'm not sure you really understand the full grasp of what the helicopter can do and how to fly it safely. And those, that time building requirement, it's a lot, it's brutal. And I, I do think it's a little bit too high. However, it, it's insurance reasons, but that time does really make you a better pilot. The more time you spend in your aircraft um, and you really understand how things work, when you make mistakes, how to get yourself out of those mistakes, you're really going to grow and become a better, safer pilot. So I like that analogy. Um, when you, when you finish flight school, uh, maybe you have a hundred or 200 hours. Those are like the typical minimums or anywhere in between, maybe a little bit more. You can go instruct at the end of those 200 hours. Um, if you have your flight instructor and preferably your CF double I, you can instruct and then you can build up all your time through instruction. At 500 hours, um, you can, that opens some doors for tours, um, maybe s some light agricultural work, maybe some power lines, um, a thousand, same thing, maybe some turbine tour jobs or some turbine power line jobs. 1500 opens the door for like the, the jobs that you, th you see as commercial. Um, and then 2000 pretty much opens the door for HEMS. So like we were just talking to a uh, case, um, 1500, 1500 hours is, uh, the Gulf, you know, you can fly turbine in the Gulf and then 2000 is helicopter EMS. So it's, it's a lot of hours, but you're really using that time, um, to build. So once I, I got my instrument, Devin, uh, I was able, very fortunate, uh, to secure a, a tour job down in the, in the port, um, Port Canaveral actually here in Florida. Now, the caveat with that was a lot of ground. Uh, there was a, a sign-off process. And honestly, I, I spend most of the time on that job um, doing ground duties as opposed to flying. I was supporting um, the pilots that were already there. And then I was training with those pilots, making sure that um, because it was a private pad, I had the entries, uh, I had the departures, uh, very key things to consider when you're flying passengers around. Because look, when you got a passenger up front and you turn left, you know, you're normally uh, used to seeing your instructor on the left seat. This person has no idea of what you're supposed to do. Uh, so, so if you look over to the left and you don't know what you're doing, you could be in a heap of trouble. So I spend most of the job, like I said, learning the ground duties, fueling the helicopter, uh, supporting that operation. And then a tinsy, tinsy bit, I was able to fly. So, um, and that's very, that's a very fortunate thing to, to do. You're normally not gonna get into tours, like you said, until you're in your 500 hours uh, type uh, deal. But I just, uh, I. I pretty much, I courted this operator uh, from the time that I was in school on, up until the time where a need uh, was created. And so he decided to, to hire me uh, for a few months, uh, uh, specifically the spring break season. And then the next one, same thing. It was, it was another tour operator uh, out of state. Uh, that one I could see the, the how things got a little bit more complex because whereas my first operator, it was, you know, you're at the beach. I was familiar with the area. So I already knew what to talk about. Now going out of state and not knowing like the particulars of the area, the airspace, any of that, I it was it was challenging to to actually uh, get get a hang of it and so uh so i'm not gonna lie i definitely struggled in those early jobs you know because i didn't have my the the cfi to fall back on and uh one of the things that when i left that job that i realized 
is I need it at CFI. And so uh, I'm doing everything within my power. Actually, next month, I'm going to Oregon to earn that certificate so I can feel rest assured that I have the tools available to provide to those uh, clients, passengers, what have you. Right. And, you know, that's that's actually what the the prime reason why I wanted to have this conversation is because I did the more uh, classic route of just going zero to CFII and just getting them all done and then start working as a CFI. That's like the the like picture model of how it can be done. However, you did it in a different way. So just getting your your commercial and your instrument and then getting picked up by a small operator and slowly building this time up, um, not the traditional CFI route. Now I can speak to the CFI route. Um, I did not think I wanted to be a CFI. And as I was going through flight instructor school, I wasn't thrilled about it because the thing about flight instructor school is it is quite difficult because you are learning the ins and outs of everything. And not only do you need to understand the basic concept, but you need to understand the why from this perspective, from this perspective, from this perspective, and this perspective, because you're going to have such a vast difference in students. Like you may have like a 70 year old Vietnam pilot um, who wants to get his uh, civilian helicopter rating. Or you may have like a 19 year old kid who's uh, just graduated high school, or you may have a stay at home mom, you may have all these different people. And if you're trying to teach aerodynamics, you as the instructor have to know it so well, so that you can break it down to a high level, a low level, and so that all your different students can understand. So I didn't think I wanted to be a CFI. And as I was going through CFI school, it was hard, because all of the concepts you have to understand at that deep level. However, afterwards and after having really understood the content and really understood that knowledge i'm a way more confident pilot you know being able to explain the why and how to everything and being able to explain it to yourself makes you just more comfortable um which makes you a safer pilot um in certain aspects now actually working as a cfi it's great i think the job i have right now i have the most freedom i will ever have in any helicopter job that I will ever experience. As a flight instructor, my goal is, and my job is to teach people how to fly helicopters, teach them all of the maneuvers, teach them how to land off airport and how to keep the helicopter safe and how to travel on long distances. As a flight instructor, at most schools I've worked at, the flight instructor has total authority to do whatever they want. And that's what I have. My bosses don't question me because they give me enough authority to plan out my students' training. You know, we have a syllabus, but I can go do whatever I want with my student. I've got the ability to go and cross countries to cool airports, to go practice maneuvers, to go explore things. I've got more freedom at this job than I will ever have. So not only does having your CFI ticket um, make you a more comfortable pilot because you're more knowledgeable, but it's also some of the most fun you will ever have. It's, it's dangerous because you're teaching people how to fly, which is inherently dangerous, but I think it's beneficial. So if you are on your journey into helicopters, even if you don't want your CFI rating, I think it may be some of the most fun flying you're ever going to do. And it is going to make you a significantly smarter um, and safer pilot to have it. And uh, it looks good on a resume. Um, if you, it just looks good on a resume to have your CFI ticket. Um, and to have dual given hours of giving instruction. I think, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely agree, uh, Devin. I mean, for um, on the personal standpoint, I do believe that the CFI is uh, something that um, it makes a better pilot. Now that's not to say that everybody should be a CFI. I, 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 I have run into that um, case um, where the individual will tell me, I'm just doing this to get hours. You know, I'm, they have no interest in doing it. They're just, it's just a roadway for them. And I, obviously I appreciate the candidness uh, when somebody comes up to me and, and tells me this um, because I'm gonna just, follow a path with that person 
that I'm, I'm not going to follow with, uh, like, for example, my fly instructor, uh, Tony, I'd do any maneuver with that man. Uh, there, there's a few pilots, uh, mainly they're, they're ATP um, um, rated pilots that I would do any maneuver, autos, whatever, you name it, I'll do it with them. But with somebody that just tells me off the bat, listen, I have no interest in being a flight instructor. I'm just here for the hours. I'm like, okay, no problem, dude. We'll go airport visit. We'll do, you know, the, the very basic maneuvers. And that's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, the, there, there are those type of people out there that, you know, are doing it just to build the hours. And then they're going to move on to their commercial jobs. And, you know, it, nothing wrong with that. Not everybody's meant to be an instructor. Like, for example, I can tell you were meant to be an instructor. Yeah. Um, I, with, with, with my heart of hearts, I'm hoping that when I am my, my certificate, I am that instructor that people will say, you know what, thank you. You know, you, you impacted me in a way that, you know, in a positive way, right. um, I, you know, we're, we're all human. We're going to have our days, but I, I want it, you know, for, for 99% of the time, I want to be that instructor that imparts uh, good knowledge, good habits. And, and whenever they're in the cockpit and everything's going, you know, uh, bad, I want them to hear my voice and say, look, you know, calm down, you know, do whatever you need to do to get this aircraft safely on the ground and then um, followed by a, a quick phone call saying thank you you know this this and that just happened to me and it was your voice that guided me down yep and you know i i absolutely love that and i can tell you right there just that attitude is everything you need to be good instructor um <clears throat> i will link to a card right here on my youtube channel i've got a video called the four things that make a good instructor um, the thing about being an instructor is it's really, really, really selfish um, to be an instructor for yourself and not think about the repercussions of your student. If you are, if you are starting your flight training, let me tell you this right now, hear me loud and hear me clear. If you have a bad instructor, switch. Do not stick with a bad instructor. If you do not get along with this person, if this person doesn't care about you, care about your well-being, care about your safety, and care about what you learn and how safe of a pilot you are in the end, switch, dump that instructor. I know it's hard, but I have had a terrible instructor and they hurt my love of flying for the time and it wasn't worth it. If you have a bad instructor, switch. Having a good instructor is more important than I think anything else in your um, aviation career. This person is going to develop your fundamentals. And if they care about you and they want the best for you, you are going to enjoy this process so much more. You're going to be invested in studying and learning. If you have an instructor that doesn't care about you, then you're not going to want to go study and really push yourself. But if you have an instructor that cares about you and that wants you to succeed, uh, you're going to want to make them happy and you're going to want to do it for yourself. And your process of learning is going to be a lot more fun and you're going to be open to the ideas they have. It's not about how good they are as a pilot. If your instructor is so cool and they can do all the cool maneuvers, that might not be what you need. You need someone that cares and that's knowledgeable. I think it's profoundly important. Um, and I just, if you have a bad instructor, please switch, you know? Um, have you had any experiences like that? Oh yeah, most definitely. I mean, I've I've had number of instructors that I just you you can tell right away that um, now when you're very new at flying, it it's a little bit harder yep. to 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 kind of tell, but you will get to a point to where you can tell. Okay, oh wow, that this guy, you know. Um, He's, he's a good instructor. He cares, or they're just there for for hours, uh, for for flight time. Uh, I actually, uh, one of the videos I made um, as I was editing, I remember um, there was one part where we were done pretty much with everything, and I said, "Hey, you know, we we can go back if you want to." 
and this this person new instructor very very green um and so he was like oh man i'm having such a great time you know that kind of deal i'm like it ain't about you you know that this should be about me once the lesson is done and we've accomplished our objectives or goals hey how about we get this ship down on the ground because at every minute that we are up there we're spending money yep. and if we don't need to be spending money of course say you know um yeah by, by all means set it down uh that's one of the things that i like uh like i said my my atp rated uh instructor especially tony the the guy that owns his own ship he will you will do so much training in an hour it will make your head spin yeah, because he knows how to utilize the time, and once that hour is done, we're done. We're on the ground. He's not playing around. He's not. He says it. He always tells this to everybody he meets. You know, this is how genuine this gentleman is. He says, "I do this because I I want to, not because I have to." You know, and and you know, it, it it's that type of you know attitude that will tell you, "Wow, what a." not only what a great instructor, but what a great human being, you yep. know? And it, it's, it's so important. And we'll just finish it off on that point. You know, if you can find an instructor that wants to be there because they want to, not because they have to, you are setting yourself up for training with success. And it's very difficult and you're not going to know for a while. Um, you're going to start training with your instructor it may not be immediately clear that they're not the right fit, but if it comes to the point where you're not comfortable and it's not a good fit switch, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, please leave them down in the comments below. We both come from different backgrounds. We've got different stories, but we all share the love of helicopters, doing it safely, um, doing it cost effectively and making the most out of our time uh, that we have with helicopters. So if you have any comments, um, feel free to shoot Jay a message um, and me leave comments in our descriptions. Go follow him on his YouTube. The link will be in uh, the description below. Um, give him a like, give him a, a, a subscribe. Same thing to me. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them. Um, I really enjoy having these conversations with you. Uh, it's really insightful. We're going to keep doing this. It's a fun series. And for anyone that's listening, um, we hope you gain something from this. Any final words from you? Uh, no, uh, we definitely, I, I got a, uh, just a little shameless self-promotion, got a video coming out today, uh, inside the R66. Uh, yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, uh, my actually through my instructor, we normally fly the, the little RV four, which is an experimental aircraft, uh, over to Williston on Wednesdays. Well, he, uh, actually talked, um, a mutual friend of ours who owns the R66 and to let me get some uh, left seat time. So I was wow. able to fly the R66 instead to uh, breakfast uh, the other day. So uh, it's a quick, uh, short, uh, energy packed video. So if you guys uh, go in there, it releases at one o'clock, uh, give it a like, uh, comment, share it, what have you. Uh, it means a lot to me. So. And that's awesome. You know, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, the R66 is a special helicopter. You know, it kind of looks like this helicopter, however, which is the R44. However, the difference is the engine. The R44 is a six-cylinder piston engine, and the R66 is a turbine helicopter, which in the helicopter industry, that turbine time is as valuable as gold. You know, um, it is, it's cool to have. So congratulations to you. That's, that's awesome to hear. You guys, thank you for listening. Um, we will see you the next time we do it, okay? Go check out Jay's channel and enjoy the rest of your day, okay?